You're very welcome to the first episode of the Final Whistle.ie League of Ireland podcast. My name is Brett Early, and this is Alan Keane. Alan Keane, of course, well known to anyone involved in the league, uh, attacking fullback, known mostly for his time in the showgrounds, Galway United, and also in Oriel Park with Dundalk. And he's going to be joining me today to take a rundown through some of the ins and outs of the transfer season, as well as maybe a chat with some of the personalities from around the league this year. We're going to have Jim McGilton on the show, the new Dundalk sporting director, is going to be talking about his role and where the club is. After maybe a bit of turmoil from the outside looking in, he's going to maybe reassure us a little bit about where Dundalk are and where they're headed for the future. We'll also be talking to at loan manager Adrian Carberry about what's involved in his season ahead and how his off-season plans have started to bear a bit of fruit in terms of better performances for Athlone and his ambitions for the year. And finally, we'll be talking to Oshin Morn, who has just directed a new documentary that's available on YouTube about life and times of Sligo Rovers. It covers kind of the period from uh, their 1970s league win right up until uh, the Willie Max Day era in 94. It's a great little show. We'll be talking to him later on in the programme. But Alan, you're with me now. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the league and in terms of maybe where we've been for the last few months because we've all been a bit of a vacuum. There's been nothing happening in our lives. The league is almost back. We've only maybe two weeks to wait. You must be kind of looking forward to getting back to watching games, even if they are on Zoom. Yeah, it's been one of the most strangest off seasons ever. Like normally, you're you're you know you're looking at players coming and going and, and the excitement of the fans building back. But yeah, this year's definitely it's strange. But look, we're here talking, so it must be close. I'm delighted that it's back. Albeit, I suppose we're not getting into the grounds. But um, uh, with this new League of Ireland website or uh, watch LOI, I think um, it's going to help massively with fans and feel a part of it again. Yeah, of course, we're going to have live commentaries and stuff on our website here, finalwhistle.ie. We'd love if you come and watch us if you can't get to a TV screen. But of course, Watch LOI is probably uh, the biggest news of the last couple of weeks in the league. It's great to see it back. Last year, how did you find the, the service? Because I loved it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it was okay. Um, there was a couple of times, I suppose, the, the streaming. But it is what it is when it's streaming. But again, it was the first season. It was... Um, really during the middle of a pandemic and it was rolled out fairly quick. But I think that a lot of clubs have have worked on that in the off season, which hoping it's uh, probably a, a bit of a better uh, stream this year. So looking forward to see what is offered. But look, it's better than nothing, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And the fact that we can get to games and the fact that we have games, we're obviously the League of Ireland has been deemed an elite uh, event rather than maybe some of the GAA people. There's been a lot of discussion about that. We're not going to get bogged down in that kind of stuff today. But it's great to see the league back. It's great to see our teams back in training, pre-season games going ahead. No issues, no COVID cases, which it's got to be really, really good from a, a league's point of view that we're getting through these training sessions and games with no no concerns, no tests, no uh, no positive tests, should I say. Yeah, most definitely. And as you said, we always have to think of the players and their welfare. And, and thankfully, to today, there's no um, no positive cases. And look, at, I think it's the lift that everyone needs within the League of Ireland, fans and players. We just need a bit of enjoyment in our in our lives right now. We've, we've, we've endured a tough, tough lockdown. And um, who knows, come the summertime, we could all be back in the grounds. Um, the cases seem to be dropping. And so long may long may it last that the cases keep dropping and, and we keep uh, we keep our fingers crossed that we're getting back in the grounds and, and, and we're having a good another good season. But I suppose the, the story changes. We're recording this maybe 48 hours before it goes live. The whole picture could have changed either positive yeah. or negative again in the yeah. next two days. Uh, at the same time, I think that's a pretty realistic expectation. At some point in the summer, we're going to be able to get back into grounds, maybe in smaller numbers. But here's hoping that it's cross fingers, toes, everything we can to see and if that will happen later in the year. You're going to take a quick look at us, uh, for us, should I say, at some of the ins and outs across the league because – there's been a lot of movement, a lot of big name movement. Um, where do you want to start? We might as well start with maybe the champions, if that's the best place to start. Yeah, I think we, we, like when I was doing this, I was like, geez, the League of Ireland never changes every year. The amount of players going in and out and jumping from club to club. But no, yeah, we look at we, we, we look at Shams and they've obviously lost Jack Byrne, Aaron McAniff and uh, Greg Bulger. So the reason I've kind of 
picked out them is because they're three central midfielders. And um, Shams, in fairness, they've, they've raided uh, Dundalk and they've gone for Gannon, uh, Sean Hoare. They've also bought in Danny Mandrew, which I think is a, is a big signer for them as well. Um, one of the standout players in the league last year when he's on his on his game. And uh, a kind of a strange one. Um, uh, Chris McCann, 33-year-old centre midfielder. So will he, will he be the same as Jack Byrne or McNiff? Possibly wouldn't have the legs. But it'll be interesting. I uh, think they probably aren't finished in the, in the market yet. And they have a good few... Uh, uh, underage coming through. But There's been a rumour of Richie Towell coming in there as well later in the not summer. In the summertime, yeah. So that's that's not confirmed yet, but um, they could be out of the league come summertime, you know. So I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'd have to say, you know. So I think you're on a mission to like get yourself blacklisted or something by Shamrock Rovers fans. No, by no, no. I think. You no, know, you won't be let back into Sligo if you don't call them Shams. <laughs> So, uh, in terms of realistically, you think they'll either have the league one or be out of contention? Oh no, I think Shams will be definitely there in contention. They're 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 there now to be knocked off the pedestal, but they have a, They still have a fantastic squad. Um, you can see in the last year they've now got to the level where Dundalk were physicality wise as well. They have a lot of leaders in the team, and uh, they have some good coaching and a good manager, Stephen Bradley. Now they know what it feels like to win. They've won the cup, they've won the league. And players like that they have league winners from previous clubs in the team, so they will be hungry. And uh, how much of a loss is Jack Byrne, though? I think he's a big loss. He made the pick. Um, you know, he, I, I think Bolger was, w- w- or, sorry, um, McAniff was excellent as well. The amount of goals they've got, so you take them their goals out of that team. Um, but then saying that, they have Gary O'Neill, who I, I think is a superb player, centre midfielder. Probably didn't play as much last year because of the lads, so I think that's a it's a big season for him. Look, there's no no doubt about it. Like Shams are going to be the team to, to beat this year again. Yeah, let's move down the table a little bit. Bowes and Dundalk coming close together there in terms of the positions. What's your thoughts on on their ins and outs? We we, we spoke. I suppose I spoke there about Mandrew being a big loss to Bowes. Um, your man Andrew Wright and then Danny Grant obviously signed, went to cross water. Both of them. But uh, they recruit well. I think they always do. They they fly under the radar a little bit with recruitment, and they they always find a gym. Um, they've got I think there's nine or ten uh, players in the, the likes of uh, Tyreek Wilson from Waterford, left back. Uh, I really liked him last year. I really yeah. like him. Two Waterford fullbacks, Sibuale as well on the other side. Uh, but I think Wilson adds something really good yeah. to that side. And Ali Coote, Waterford midfielder, by all accounts, like I've seen him play as well last year, very, very good. Bastian Harry, who we all know from his time at Waterford, very, very good signing. Uh, Rory Feely from Waterford. You know, so they've raided Waterford. Um, the lad I'm looking forward to seeing is the Bradley Rolt. He's on loan from Peterborough, striker. Um, so I think he could could be the, the gym that they find or that Liam Burt, uh, he's a, I think he was a Scotland on the 21 international so um, but welcome to the League of Ireland, they're playing Finn Harps away first game of the season <laughs> So, no, no better place to start. I, Let's skip yeah. Dundalk because we're going to talk to Jim Magilton and we'll, we'll talk about a lot of that uh, down the line. But next club in the league table last year, of course, Sligo Rovers, one that we're both familiar with. But what's your thoughts on the recruitment this year? Because I think coming into the season last year, it's fair to say recruitment was poor and yet they had such a phenomenal season. And in the end, this year it seems to be a little bit stronger. Yeah, I think I think um, Liam has been shrewd in, in in the market. Like he's gone for players as well with experience within the league, which is good. Um, I think last year, you know, Timu coming in didn't really work out. Um, I suppose you had Junior coming in halfway through the season, didn't particularly do well. Seymour, uh, who's moved on, um, probably the loss I would say the biggest loss would be, but he's replaceable is Coughlin. Um, I liked him as a player. Um, Pats will do well to have him, but look at. He's brought in Walter Figueroa, uh, Jordan Gibson from Patsons, Shane Blaney, Robbie McCourt, you know, and then you, you, you're getting back um, uh, Romeo. Uh, Romeo. Romeo so, Parks, yeah, Romeo Parks. So, look, and young Johnny Kenny coming through is going to be a good little find for them, I think, this year. He's a good little lad. Um, really, really important. Again, Dundalk at home, first game of the season. 
be interesting to see. That will tell you where 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 it will be for the year. Like I, I know it's only first game of the season, but if you can get a win there, you're you're on to a, you know you're off to a flyer. Yeah. It creates confidence, and confidence is so so good. At, you know, and you get a good start. Well, Sligo seem to have the hoodoo sign over Dundalk uh, in recent years, particularly yeah. when it comes to penalties. And Ed McGinty must love giving penalties uh, or facing penalties from Pat Hooven. Uh, it seems to be kind of a twice a season kind of a ordeal for, for Hooven at the moment to kind of score. I think he's only managed one in four against um, McGinty. In terms yeah. of uh, the next group together, Waterford, they just seem to be totally unpredictable in terms of... But that, that happens year on year. It happened a bit last year as well, and they were comfortable towards the end of the season yeah I, I i worry about waterford this year to be fair um they've lost a lot a lot of good players and they haven't they've replaced them with a lot of young lads I, look, looking at it today there's a king kavanagh he's only 18 now they got oscar brennan from shells um you know kate lego Matigo, 20 year old from bows underage you know, Jack Stafford, Kyle Ferguson, Cameron Evans, a lot of young lads, um, a lot of loanies, which I don't really agree with sometimes too many loan players because when the going gets tough, you know, they know they're going back to another club. Um I'm not saying that 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 that'll happen, but it's just there's a lot of a lot of unpredictability with Waterford in the off season and you know, uh, it'll be a tough job for Kevin Shee. But bear in mind that Waterford did win the under-19 competition in 2019. So there's a lot of young, good talent in that kind of 18, 19, 20 age bracket yeah. in the town. De- definitely, but it's a massive step up from 19s to, 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 to Premier Division football. If you're saying going to First Division where you kind of that natural progression, well, you know, when you're putting these young lads in against the likes of the Shamrock Rovers, the Dundalks, Metro Rovers, those, you know, you get eaten up and confidence is massive. And for young lads... You need experience around them, and I just feel that Waterford could struggle this year. Um, Do you think they could be this year's Cork with so many loan signings that it could be very similar in terms of the makeup of the squad, and they could be in trouble? I think, yeah, I think they could. Um, look at I, uh, I'll come back in a, in a couple of weeks after, and I'll leave worse. But that's my yeah. I, I think they will be be the Cork of the league this year, and um, you know, yeah, obviously St. Pat's they've they've recruited well as well. Um, you know, Longford, I think, struggle a little bit. With a lot of they've signed, re-signed a lot of players, and uh, I just find from my time at Galway when we came up from the first division, we signed a lot of our players back. And by God, it was it was an eye opener when you got to the Premier. It is it is tough, you know. Um, physical. Well, Drogheda have also signed back a load of their players. Like they've signed back maybe 16, 17 of their squad. Now they've brought in some experience, yeah. like Aaron Gabe, um, Gary. Deegan is in there as well. Dane Massey. Dane has a little bit of, yeah, so they've got a little bit of a spine of that team, even yeah. in those four. Um, but go, Longford haven't really done that. No. Aaron that's Dodd, the, the exception. Yeah, that's the worry. Um, you have Longford, uh, they, they, Paddy Kirk from Bowes, they, they got as well. But I just find that they've done really well. But look at, um, who knows? There, It's the first season in. You can, you can have that. They could go on a run from the start, you know. That's that's the unpredictability of the league. But I think overall in the season, unless they recruit through, throughout the summer, um, it could be a long season for them. Now they're they're totally their aim is to stay up, and that's their whole you know whole target. Right. I'd like probably agree with most of what you said. I think there will be a couple of standouts from them though this year, and I think one to watch. The Premier Division clubs might not be that uh, familiar with, or the Premier Division's fans at least won't be that familiar with, is in the middle of the park. And A. Durfin's yeah, been Durfin, impressive. We've yeah. seen him a couple of times. Now he's a bit of a headless chicken at times, but I find when he plays with with Dean Zambra beside him in particular, um, there just seems to be that settling influence on him, and he's just he's box to box and he never stops. And if there's a chance he'll he's able to stick it from 20, 25 yards as well, like so it's. He he will impress a few people, I think, this season. No, definitely. I, I I've heard a lot about him, and then I watched the playoffs last year, and I was really really impressed with him. Very confident, gets around the pitch. So it's a big year for him. Um, he'll enjoy he'll enjoy the the the, the premier, um, compared to the first division where he he'll be able to showcase his talent because you get a bit a little bit more time on the ball, a little more. Whereas in the first division, it's it is people don't believe it, but it is a tough league to come out of because it's. It's physical and it's it's kick, you know. 
We haven't talked about Derry yet, and they've signed some very impressive, particularly yeah. up front, uh, the likes of Park House. Um, they've also brought in uh, that Joe Hodge, although it looks like he'll be injured for the first couple of games of the season. And also they brought in Malin um, from Sheffield United as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how they emerge. And if they really fire early on, they could be an outside bet for for a top three, top four finish. Well, not an outside bet, they're there anyway, but but they could really push for even the top two. Is that realistic or has that kind of been too ambitious? No, I think, yeah, Derry, Derry, um, they're, they're, they're a strange side sometimes. I, I, I expected them to be higher than the war last year. I thought they struggled, but they've definitely done well this year. They've got Danny Lavatory back from, uh, signed back from Shams, you know, uh, good experience. Uh, Will Patchy on loan from Dundalk. So he, I think he's recruited well. He's only he's lost McCormick, Cherry, and Horgan. So they always always produce players there, and I think they will be up there um, this year. But again, it all boils down to how the signings set settle in. You look at as you said, Joe Hodge. I'm really really looking forward to seeing him. Um, I I love seeing him playing in, in the on, in the internationals. Um, and he's with Derry City, so the league will be. It'll be, it'll be a good place and I'm delighted to see him in the league and to be able to show how his talents are. Yeah, of course, St. Pat's as well, second year for Stephen McDonald. It's been a kind of an interesting um, year for him. Most people probably say disappointing year based on mm. the investment and the, the recruitment last year. Is he under pressure this year? What do you think of the recruitment so far? I think, uh, yeah, Stephen, Stephen O'Donnell is like, I've played with Stephen and um, like quality player. I, I've no doubt he will be a quality manager. Um, last year, yeah, I was hoping to do a little bit better. They were struggling. I, I, I was like, you know, they, they, so, you know the way football is. But uh, they stuck with him. I think this year is a big, big year for him. Um, he has to produce. And I think they have to get top four, top three this year. Uh, they've recruited well. They've got, you know, obviously John Manley, who's multiple league winner, cup winner, and the keeper from Liverpool. Um, Jaros after losing Brendan Clark, you know they've lost Brendan Clark and George Kelly was there last year. They signed Paddy Barrett, uh, another multiple league winner. Ronan Coughlin, as we know from from Sligo Rovers, uh, and Melvin Lambert. He's a striker with on loan from Reading. Uh, and then they have Alfie Lewis, who's on loan from West Ham. Again, I've seen with Sligo, uh, Sligo Rovers, the loans coming out didn't really work under Dave Robinson at the time. So it'll be interesting to see how these loan loanees work out. Um, you're always taking a chance on a loanee because if it doesn't work out, they know they're going back into a contract back in England. You know, So that's yeah. where their loyalties lie, if you know what I mean. Finally, we have to talk about Ollie's army up in Finn Park. And of course, uh, always defying the odds, still in the Premier Division. I think it's their third season uh, in a row, which um, they'll be happy with. But again, if you talk to Ollie, he'd probably tell you that uh, their ambition is just to survive. If, he, if you gave him the playoff now, he'd probably take it, according to himself. Or should his ambitions be rising a little bit with the addition of maybe one or two perceived weaker teams in shape along for their draw? Yeah, I think this year might be a good year for Ollie. I think. He might be a little bit. He, he they, they will always be flirting around there. Like it is difficult to get players to do Finn Harris. Um, but Ollie's done a tremendous job. Like absolutely tremendous. A year in, year out. But I think he's he's done well. He's got Seymour from Sligo, which probably be a good sign. It didn't really work out here at uh, at Rovers for him. Eaton Boyle is back. Um, signed from Enfield. Ryan Rainey, who was previously with Wolves, and then Ryan Shanley is a big striker. Uh, with Pitts. So, look, I think, you know, we spoke about Waterford, we spoke about Longford. I think Finn Harps had the experience of being in the league now for the last while. Um, I think they should be third, fourth from bottom, fourth from bottom, I would I would probably say. I'm hoping for Ollie's sake. I don't think we'd be seeing them in the top four, put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with that. Although I, I do think they've kept the nucleus of last year's team, the, the better elements. And obviously, Raf Cotaro has retired, who you'd be well familiar with as well over the years. Um, but I think Finn Harps should probably be aiming for that seventh or sixth place. And it's a realistic target for them this year, when maybe I would have said anyway, uh, yeah. who am I though? Uh, maybe eight, ninth was a good year for them. I think this year they should be looking at a step or two up the ladder a little bit further. And that kind of brings us to the end of the table. Anyone in the first division? Because Shells, Galway, 
at loan, we're going to talk to Adrian Carberry later on. Galway, Cork have all recruited pretty well in the off season. Treaty have signed a few names from around the league as well in the last week. So, anyone, one or two names maybe stand out that you've seen into any of those clubs? Um, no, I've, I've I've seen it's quite something. The first division with Shells, Galway, Cork, you know, and interesting to see with with, with Treaty. I think Galway, uh, John Caulfield's, uh, I suppose John Caulfield being there. I think that'll be a massive influence for Galway. I think they're they're asleep and joint and the, the good backers and in, in the the comers. Um, I think the recruitment uh, John Caulfield has done has been good. Um, I think Shell's recruitment. I, I so, some of the Shell's. I was like uh, they're recruiting for the Premier Division. I thought they were still in the Premier. You know, so they're going to be the team to watch. You know, um, at loan as we as as we spoke to to Adri, um, it'd be interesting to see that they've ambitions themselves. So look at it, it's going to be a competitive, and that's what we want, you know. And the first division, I think, for years has just been lying, lying idle, and it just needs that a bit of awakening. And I think there's some fantastic teams and uh, and uh, another league that's going to be really competitive, which will only it's only going to help us. Absolutely, I think it's it's a great year ahead. And the first division is actually going to be really exciting for anybody who's not even involved in yeah. it this year. I think it's going to get a lot of coverage as well. Shells and Cork, Galway, um, at loan might be a little bit off the pace just yet. We'll hear a bit more about that from Adrian later in the program. But let's get on to the meat of today's show, and that, of course, is our interview with our three guests. And we're going to start off uh, with a little chat we had earlier today with Jim Magilton, the new sporting director in Dundalk. There's been a lot of change at Dundalk since the cup final was held in early December last year. And one of the biggest changes that has come in has been the introduction of a new sporting director there in the shape of Jim Magilton. And he joins us now. Jim, uh, you're very welcome to the programme. Thank you, Brethnet. Looking forward to hearing what you have to tell, say to me. <laughs> well, I think we're more interested in hearing what you might have to say to us. Tell us a little bit about why you've come into the league and why Dundalk was such an attractive uh, proposition for you at this time in your career? I think I think it was just the challenge working at the IFA. I completed that. Uh, my thoughts when I entered the IFA seven years ago was to try and build a pathway, create a pathway for the best young players in Northern Ireland. And my thoughts then, alongside Michael O'Neill, was you know, we needed a full-time academy. And Seven years down the line, we managed to achieve that with uh, UEFA, through the fantastic people that were working there. And and it kind of way I'd reached the end and just felt that way. And I've been kind of way looking to get back into the game in some capacity. And I've had numerous conversations with Bill Holtzheiser and the board of directors. And I like the thought of entering into a professional club in Ireland, uh, Dundalk having had great success over many, many years. And it just seemed the next logical step for me. And it really enthused me. It, uh, it really motivated me. And I was ready for a new challenge. Simple as that. Yeah, it's, it's been great to see some of your calibre come in, I suppose, obviously managing in the championship in England with Ipswich over many, many years. Your playing career obviously needs no introduction to most football fans on the island. Uh, you've been with Shamrock Rovers before, you know the league. What's been the big difference between the league in, say, 2011 when you were with Shamrock Rovers and now? It's hard. It's really hard to tell, to be honest. You know, I find that out as the, as the season progresses and the quality of the opposition. Uh, what I do think has changed is obviously the how competitive the Irish clubs have been in Europe. I think when I look at it, I, I look at the quality of player, I look at the quality of the squad and I see that over four or five teams. In my time it, with Michael, it was, it was still a very competitive league, uh, but we the, the expectations at Shamrock Rovers was to win the league. Michael won back-to-back -back titles. The next logical step for us was to try and be more competitive in Europe. And we gained great success with a really good, good gr group of players. And I still get that feeling. I get that feeling now with this group. I like the feel in the group. I like the quality in the group. We've added uh, to the squad. Uh, and I just get the impression that these lads are 
they loved obviously any player, and I'll not tell you, any player that gets the opportunity to play in Europe, and that happened late in my career in terms of club football. But any any player who has aspirations to play at the highest levels wants to be competitive in, in Europe. So for a club like Dundalk to have that sort of success, phenomenal success to get two group uh, stages is, is huge. So again, it's, a, it's this mentality of a European club in Ireland. And there are classic examples out there. You only have to look at Mulder, for example, and Rosenberg and other, other real examples where they've been competitive every year. So you have to acknowledge the fact that Shamrock Rovers had a fantastic season last year and they've thrown down the gauntlet. So it's up to all the other clubs now in the League of Ireland to be ready for that challenge moving forward. And Jim, you, you spoke there about uh, being, you obviously want to be challenging for Europe. Um, I've always said it that we do need a, a mix of players and coming in from international to be internationally recognised. Was that behind your thoughts of getting so many uh, various international uh, players in? Yeah, it was, Alan. And, and, and again, listen, good players, you know, good players are good players. You go after them. And if the market's strong, you have to be competitive in that. I have to say the due diligence carried out in, the, in, in our transfer window was very strong. We had individual conversations. We, we kind of had to lay, lay it out bare to players that it's a tough league. If you underestimate this league, it, it, it will be at your peril and it'll come back to bite you. So we looked at the attitude and just the basic conversations we had with these players and we identified strengths uh, that one, they're going to come in and enhance hopefully the league and make the league better. Mm. And as a result, they make us more competitive uh, in Europe. Again, competition in squad, as you know, is crucial. If you're going to be competing at domestic and European levels, you need a strong squad. So we've added that. We lost good players, but we've added to that. And hopefully, you know, the next stage for us is, is, is to keep recruiting. Very strong emphasis on the academy now. You know, we brought Stevie yeah. McDonald in. We're, we've... You know, Randall Keynes emerged pre-season, Val's emerged pre-season, but one or two young players. And the strength of a club, I always believe, is the foundations laid out in your academy. And, and we're very strong in that. In fact, today we had a very productive meeting talking about that. Yeah, because I, I would say, speaking from my time there in 2016, the, the academy, there, was, there wasn't, I was shocked at how successful Dundalk were, but yeah. yet there was nothing coming through. As yeah. in the academy, it, it was really a mess. Yeah. Like, and I had come from, say, Saigo, where they were yeah. just starting out a, a, a good structure. Yeah. Um, and you've mentioned Stevie, Stevie there. Uh, Stevie McDonald, I've done my badges with him. And top quality, he's done really well with, with Warren Point at the time. And yeah. Is he now over the the running of the academy uh, set up? And, and how, like, how young have you gone? So, yes, yeah, Stevie McDonald's in. He's an academy manager. Say we had a really productive meeting with all the staff. You know, if you're going to build a club, you have to understand mm. how we want to play, the way we want to play, the profile of the player we want at the football club. And that starts off. The good thing about it is, you quite rightly says, it's a blank canvas. And from a blank canvas, you can yeah. create your own your, your own pathway. So we're, we're going 10 to 13. We obviously need the help of the clubs and the leagues within Dundalk. Dundalk have yeah. always produced top class players. So we're looking yeah. 10 to 13 program and then obviously that 14 to 19 now. And we look we're looking at the quality of coaches, where they are in their coaching badges. Can we help them develop as coaches? And again, my background for the last seven years has been about creating pathways for young players. Filippo comes from a similar background alongside uh, Giuseppe. Stevie Mack has done terrific jobs at uh, Warren Point. He also, I brought him into the, the academy up at Jordanstown, so yeah. I know what he's going to deliver. And the good thing about a Stevie McDonald Allen is that you won't have to stand over him. I think we're all on the same page in yeah. terms of how we want to develop and the style of play we want to. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. He loves the game, he's enthusiastic, and he's always looking to improve as well. I, I thought I was really impressed with him when I was doing my badges. He was yeah. the knowledge he has and stuff, and I know he had to finish his career fairly young. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, he's just gone from strength to strength sense. And, and uh, I think you have a great lad there. Um, yeah. I have a question for you, Jim, and just in relation to the, the kind of movements around the club, because obviously 
over the last maybe six to eight months, we've seen a lot of ins and outs on, yeah. on the pitch, in the dugout, in the boardroom even. Yeah. Um, and I suppose a lot of fans looking at this might be looking for kind of a some sort of indication of a bit more stability in the club. Wh wh where is the club at the moment in terms of having that kind of stable base to build on for the future? Yeah, listen, people come and go at football clubs. People come and go at football. That's the nature of the game we're in. Uh, and people have left the club. So we're now in the in the process of recruiting uh, the people, the right sort of people we want uh, in the club. This club was this club was being you know built on success. Alan was there, so he knows exactly what that feels like, and the people within the club. And you look at the the fantastic of success, the su fantastic success that they've had over the last six, seven, eight years when Stephen was there. So we're, we're we we want to build on that. You can't forget about that because it's a really proud tradition they have, and to build on that, it's important to get the right sort of personnel in the club. As you know, Brethna, you and I have had serious conversations around this. So we're recruiting, we're interviewing, we want to make sure that stability is 100% the, the correct word for this. We want to make sure that the people we bring in will be there for many years to come. And again, it's just about the quality. You know, we want, my, my ideal of management, I'm, I'm, you know, is this authentic leadership type where I cannot, I don't want to stand over Alan Keane and tell him how to do his job or breath and early to tired. You're, you're going to be hard and appointed because you're better at your job than I am. That's your area of expertise. I'm just there to manage you and make sure that you've got all the support you need to deliver. And then it's up, and then it's up to us as a group. Off the park, you know, we, we streamed the game on Saturday and it was really successful. And we did it. And, all, and Paddy Casey and Gavin McLaughlin and Aaron Lawless and Stephanie Roach, everybody did a fantastic job. And that was that's just the start for us, you know. We just want to again be as successful off the park as we are on it. And it's very difficult, of course. There are extreme circumstances we are all living in and dealing with. So we're going to try our best. Yeah, I did watch the stream like Friday or Saturday. I can't remember. Friday, sorry, like, Friday, yeah. um, I watched the stream, and really, it was head and shoulders above anything in a streaming capacity that's been done by any of the clubs in, in the league. It really does kind of move that bar up in terms of the, the pre match, the post match, the, all that sort of stuff was just really, really on the money. And if that's a sign of where, I suppose, where the club is going, it's, it's a good sign. I suppose we, we have to also ask you a few other questions about that, that we're going to get asked if, if we don't ask in yeah. terms of like, what's the plans for the ground? Are there any plans for the ground? Can you give us any information on that? Not, not, not really, not at the moment. You know, um, we are looking at areas within Oriel Park that we want to develop. And I think if we can get that over the line, then the match day experience will improve dramatically. There are opportunities for us then to encourage sponsorship, to encourage people. But, and if we get people in, and fingers crossed that we do, to, to really enjoy that experience. If you're, if you're winning football matches and you're as successful as Bundock has been, then we're, again, our job off the field is to create the right sort of atmosphere to encourage not only families, but all aspects of uh, the football crowd that make up the football crowds that I have been particularly used to yet, for example, in Ipswich Down and North Southampton or Sheffield Wednesday or wherever I've been, and to try and bring that sort of enjoyment in. And I have to be honest, there are good people now who are looking at that and looking very closely at that. And uh, and as I say, we're, we're looking to develop that. As soon as we get the, the thumbs up from government, then hopefully we'll be ready to rock and roll. And Jim, you spoke earlier about the loss of players, and of course, like we all know, as you said, players move on and that. Did you come in at a time when the players basically nearly had their minds made up? And unfortunately, it was <laughs> that bit too late. Like, you know, you look at the likes of uh, Sean Gannon has been there years, yeah. successful, great lad, one of the best right backs in the league. Yeah. You know, Sean Hoor, who had a, a, a successful uh, yeah. spell. And I think you do well to keep it, to be honest with you. To be honest, I thought Michael Duffy might have been gone, but I knew yeah. your maybe connection and stuff with him, he, you know, he'd have a good chance. Uh, I think that was crucial. Um, yeah. Who else you had? Well, Gary Rogers, obviously. Yeah. John, John Magney. John Magney left. Dean yeah. Matthew left. Yeah. So, like, yeah. If you look, Alan, you know, like you've been around them, like, and that core yeah. group who have been yeah. massively successful. That's a massive loss. They're yeah. huge losses for any football yeah. club. But the job, so yeah, the, the basic answer is, with one or two, we tried, but again, 
football being the way it is, obviously there was different things going on, and they made their choices. And good luck to them. You know, yeah. Exactly. And when I came in, the, the job was then to recruit players, and it's very difficult when you say similar or better. When you look at the successes and the careers that these guys have had at successful clubs, but especially Dundalk, that's always difficult to replace. What we have hopefully have done is gone out into the market, identified the right player, and then it's over to them. Again, when you cross the white line, it's definitely down to you. No matter how much yeah. we as managers or coaches get stick, the responsibility rests with players. And we think we've recruited well, but again, it'll be down to them and how they deliver. In terms, Jim, of the, I suppose, the gap that exists at the moment based on last year's league table between yourselves and Bowes in second and, and the bigger gap again to, to Rovers, can Dundalk bridge that this year? Is that realistic in terms of getting back to that level? We in hope terms- so. You know, we're putting together a squad that we want to be competitive. As I say, Seamac Rovers, again, have recruited well. They've lost good players. And it's the same. Any football club across the globe, you're trying your very best. I think we'll be competitive. I think we will be challenging. I do believe that uh, consistency uh, was a factor last year, highs and lows. We can take the COVID situation into consideration. We can take the European exertions into consideration. But the cup final was a was a marker. You know, the, the, the players responded. Sean McGraw was played very well in the day. But I think that was a marker, not only for Dundalk, but the other clubs that... You know, we, we will be competitive. I'm sure Bowes, Pats, other clubs will have a say in what goes on this year. We're trying to deal with our business. As I say, we are got a squad together that we're happy with. I think we still need one or two additions, and we're still looking for that. But I'm happy with where we are. More importantly, the manager, the coaching staff, the technical team around um, around us. Basically, you know, we're all we're all looking forward to it. And pre-season, I'll tell you, I've been in pre-season and won every game and had a stinker of a start. Oh, my goodness. Where you couldn't buy a win. And the reverse of that is awful pre-season and then hit the ground running. And momentum in football is is huge. Yeah. And you build that momentum and you go on these winning streaks. So we're looking to build momentum right from the, right from the off. I suppose, uh, finally, one, I've one question. Alan might have another one or two. But in terms of... Um, the expectations on you for the next um, 12, 24, 36 months. Yeah. Uh, you've come into a role. Uh, it's not really that common in the country at the moment in the league. It's kind of a new role. Yeah. Um, where, what, what do you want to be judged on over the next two to three years? Like, are we looking at results on the pitch? Are we looking at players progressing through the academy, financial reports? What's your focus in terms of your performance over the next two to three years? Well, all of what you just said, Brethna, you know, so, of course, results, of course, recruitment, of course, building a, a, a supply line to our first team, creating that pathway, having an identity, uh, Dundalk producing fine young players, uh, financials are massive, you know, given the restrictions, given the huge efforts that's going to be needed in order to, you know, really gather momentum in terms of sponsorship for the club that given the present circumstances the world is in that's a huge challenge for every football club not only in the league of ireland but across the globe so yeah i probably the 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 longevity of the game for me being in the game so long is that the one thing i always had was enthusiasm and a desire to get better and if i didn't know something i'd go and ask like i asked you brethna do you know so (laughs) and and i you know so so i'm always learning and I'm always prepared to learn, and I'm I'm always prepared to pick up the phone and ask questions. I went in as an elite performance director in the IFA seven years ago, and I had no clue what that meant. I had no idea. It was, you know, head of coach education. Oh, great. Well, I had a fantastic mentor and manager in Nigel Best who showed me the ropes. And then to create a pathway for young players in Northern Ireland was very simple. Increase contact time and work with the clubs. Increase the contact time to a... To a a position where the same boys in professional clubs in mainland Britain were getting three, four times more than the boys in this on this island. And the one thing that we do have is enthusiasm, desire, all the buzzwords that would, that are linked to any major sport. 
but especially our kids, our kids' application and attitude to the game is top class. They just need direction. They just need uh, an environment, a challenging environment. So what we're going to do is create a challenge environment for everybody. The off the field staff have to be challenged because quite right in what you said in terms of it's difficult out there, but so what? It's difficult for everyone. No excuses. We've just got to go and find the right people to come in and invest in the football club. We have fantastic investors in place already and also to be competitive on the pitch. The core group of players, the Shields, the Hobans, the McElhenney's, the Duffy's, you know, the Garland's, the Boyle's, the Cleary's are still there. They know how to win games. So their pride would have been hurt. And I've been in that dressing room. We'll tell you, pride's a massive thing in football too. The pride would have been dented. To finish 20 points behind Sean McRovers is not good. It's not good. But that you have to accept it. And you got to move on. You got to roll your sleeves up and you got to apply yourself and you got to hit the ground running. If you hit the ground running, then you give yourself every opportunity to be competitive. I think we'll probably end up leaving it there. That pretty much sums everything up. Jim, absolute gentleman, thank you so much for having a, the take on time to have a chat with us. Brilliant. It's been a thank pleasure. You, Alan, thank you very much. Cheers, Jim. All the very Thanks best, so much. lads. Take care. Bye now. Cheers. Good luck for the season. Thanks, mate. All the best. Now, of course, we're going to turn our attention to the first division and one of the clubs that are making waves, kind of, with some of the signings they've made in the close season and really look to be uh, really stepping up a gear, I think, has been at loan. I'm glad to say we're joined by their manager, Adrian Carberry. Now, Adrian, you're very welcome to the programme. Perfect. Thanks, Mia. Great to be here. Um, it's great to have you on the show. Um, tell us a bit about, I suppose, the change in Athlone this year. I suppose perennial over the last few years have struggled a little bit. We all know about the Cup semi-final last year and, and the circumstances around that and how disappointing that might have been. But it seems to be a, a horse of a different colour this year from Athlone. Yeah, look, um, I, I suppose Athlone over the last number of years have been, as a club, training in Dublin there wasn't much buy into the town from 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 Athlone Town Football from local uh, companies or businesses or the local people, I suppose. And um, so, I suppose they got in contact with me initially to, I suppose, bring Athlone back to Athlone as such, and, and get them back training Athlone, uh, bearing the fantastic facility they have now down there, and, and using that, utilizing that, and just getting the public to, to come and see us, you know. So. Um, obviously, the virus got in the way of that a bit. But yeah, look, we 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 were late coming to the party, I suppose, in terms of signing players at the start of the season, and uh, we just were left with kind of maybe some players that you know other clubs didn't want, or whatever. But I have to say, the guys did, did, did fantastic for us at times. Um, we did compete at times, but we were short, uh, short players. Um, and I suppose that was most notable in, in the game against uh, we played on dock then the cup semi final. Having done so well in the semi-final against against Shelburne, I suppose he come on top. Um, it didn't happen against uh, Dundalk, a, a truly professional outfit. So we were showing up there. Um, so I, I suppose the club, the committee, and everyone behind behind it alone were were, were anxious to uh, progress it on. That it's gone so well off the field, and now maybe now now is the right time to put a team in place that that I can push on towards the top of the table. So I suppose with that in mind and, and the support we've got, um, that's what we're trying to do, try to sign players that, that would push us on towards, towards the top half of the table or the top of the table. It's a fairly uh, competitive first division this year. The likes of Cork, Shells all seem to have recruited really well through this, this uh, winter. Uh, I suppose Galway there too. Alan might have some views on, on Galway's preparations for the year, but what are the expectations for the season? I think I think we have to be re realistic. I, th I think you're very right. Um, we have strengthened and strengthened very well, but other teams have strengthened too as well. And you see Galway going full time, um, Shelburne full, you know, full time as well. You're, you're looking at Cork, Cork down as well, a fantastic club. So it's really very hard. And then you have, you know, Bray Wanders. You have UCD. who are always strong. So it's going to be very, very, very tough for us. But I, I mean, we need to get away from this second from bottom, bottom of the table. We need to get away from this. We need to push on. And Athlone is a footballing town, really is, and we need to start, you know, putting putting that in, to show on the pitch as well, and making sure that we can we can fight for. We're looking at a playoff place this year at the very minimum, um, and that's just said a over. We have other goals inside of that as well, um, and and look, we 
we'd love to win the league as well. But look, um, we won't get too far ahead of ourselves. We will set the goal that we want to be up there come the end of the season, even a chance of getting to, to where we all want to be, and that's the top division. Adrian, um, a point I picked up on, on you there is it's great uh, to hear you say that because every year everyone just writes off at loan, bottom of the table, and it's um, it's I think it's a massive thing that you've got the 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 team training in that loan because I think that's a big big uh, plus because you need to buy into the town. But for you saying that your target is the playoff, that definitely rubs off on players because I think uh, now the players if they have a manager they can believe um, I think that's important how difficult have you found it in the off season to attract players obviously with COVID and all that is difficult especially with all the teams that you have like so Galway you have all these teams that people will go to because they're cities and stuff like that have you found that difficult? Yeah Alan I you know, you're offering players, I suppose, part-time, you know, football, semi-professional football, and it's out there they're offering professional contracts. You know, so it really is you're, you're fighting. You're, you know, you're on, on the, the losing side nearly straight away. But but we have guys and um, experienced players who have you know, you know, full-time jobs at the moment, and it probably wouldn't be realistic for them to go um, and look at families. They have families now, or might be buying a home. You know, so full-time football doesn't really appeal to them. At this level, I, I do feel Alan will get better. I, I do think you know, um, football in Ireland you know, now is, is heading in the right direction. We're a long way off. I think it will get there. Um, more professional, more money pumped into it. I think that that will come in time. Um, but you know, so although players do look at full time, I think a lot of more realistic. The experienced guys we got in, and in terms of to have a job or to have a mortgage, so they're they're keeping their jobs and, and they're able to come down with us part time. Now it, it, it is. A, Commitment, um, you know, it is a big com- commitment, but we're we're delighted to have them. Uh, we spoke to the guys and we talked about the project we're on. We, we call it a project. Um, we've just introduced a, a new gym installed down there. You know, and Alice's room on in there as well. So we are adding to the to, to the facilities there. It's not the finished article by a long shot. But in fairness to to the background people there, the committee, John Hayden and Michael O'Connor and the rest of the committee there, they are, are trying to. They're adamant that. You know what happens on the pitch. You know won't leave the club in trouble. We have to put the measure, and um, but are, you know looking after, making sure the facilities are there, and and, and uh, everything that the players want is there when they, when they come into us. So that is we kind of sat down with players and talked to them, um, and and the players are signed, bought into that, and saw it. You know that it's an exciting opportunity, and, and I think Alan, you can see by the players we've signed, a lot of them are kind of players that might have just. With big clubs and kind of, you know, got lost a small bit, maybe, you know. So, yeah. this is another chance for them, and they're coming in with chance to get, get in, in the first division, play, play first team football against quality teams and start, start their careers again, I suppose. Yeah. How much of a loss, uh, when you talk about the new players that have come in, one or two players have moved on, uh, some probably by the club's choice, one or two others. Tell us about the two, I suppose, cup heroes from last year, Dean George and Ronan Manning have both moved on. Were efforts made to keep them or or is it just one of those things that you can't compete with Galway in a full-time capacity or, or why, why, why are those two players kind of not with the club this season? <clears throat> Yeah, well, well, Ronan, Ronan you know, has been a superstar for us this year. Been very good. And um, bearing in mind, guys, you know, he came to us because no other club would sign him. You know, he, um, Galway didn't really want to know last season, and uh, um, I was actually told to stay away from the guy. You know that he had this bad reputation. Um, I sat down with him, I talked to him, and I found out, out, out that he, he's a lovely guy. He, he just needs to be motivated like everyone else, um, and, and he hit the ground running for us. Um, he, he, there's a lot of improvements still still to make. He's he's still a young lad. He's 20, you know, 21 now probably, but um, uh, you know he was very good for us. He did say it. He, he wanted you know his brothers you know full time in football, and he saw the chance to play full time football uh, with Galway. So so it makes it makes it sense for him that, that he would he would do that. Um, but he was very good for us, and you know we, we had one or two little uh, disagreements, like have every player. You know, so I found him fantastic to work with, and I wish him all the best. He was, he was good for us, and you can't stop a guy that wants to play um, full time football when it's there for him. Um, I have no problem with that. D- Dean, um, you know, it, it was a tough one. It came down to you know borderline decision: will we, will we not? Um, and although he was against Shelburne, 
you know, we, we just just felt that, you know, we're looking for something different, maybe in a striker. We need something like that will, will score goals for us. Um, and that's it, you know, you know, and, and uh, probably a bit harsh in the end, but, you know, we, we, we we're still not there yet in terms of having huge depth. We can't afford huge depth at the moment. So just just one of these things that Dean just missed out. And the like the season on the sign for a tr- treaty, um, which is good, good for them too as well, and good for him to keep going. Still a young guy as well. But um, we we just felt that uh, with the players we brought in, um, Dean's I suppose his opportunities would would be you know um minimal this season. So um, and uh, we. We just wanted to as well make sure that he got a chance to play play games as well, you know. So I probably think it's And uh, Adrian, how's uh, pre-season been for you? How, how, how has the preparation? I know it's difficult in these times and I'd say it's very, very strange. But uh, as as terms of coming up for the season ahead, how has it been like? You know, from it's, it's difficult when you can't really, you know, with the fixtures and stuff like that, trying to organise friendlies and with covid I'm sure that's a, a another torn in your side. Yeah, you know everything is, is a way more taught and planning gone gone into it. All I'd say, and as well as that, you know, you're 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 talking to guys in in, in pre-contract meetings about you know um, full use of a gym and you come down as well, and and, and now we can't use that, you know. So, um, but look, it is it is, it is hard. There's a lot of your know, protocols around it. But bearing in mind, it is to try and get rid of this virus. So it's important we 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 do play our part. It's important that we do the right things and make sure that that you know we're, we're trying our best. We do make mistakes, uh, but it's important that we we learn from them too as well. Um, but the overriding thing, Alan, as a player, you know yourself. For these guys to be back playing and training, yeah, yeah. It, it's just and even for coaches ourselves, it is fantastic. There, nothing beats it. And uh, I missed it. I felt the first lockdown w- w- was grand. The weather was good, and we could we got through it. You know, the second one not too bad. This one has been the longest one for everyone, and um, we've all felt it a bit. And um, so to get back training is just fantastic. So we, we we really need to mind mind and make sure we do everything right that we can stay. You know, and uh, we get please God for once and for all get rid of this virus. Yeah. Adrian, in terms of the atmosphere on the club, I was at a couple of home games in Athlone last year and I was there at the very start of the season when you were running kind of well. I think you got three wins in the first three or four games and, and there was a really decent crowd there. I was also there post-COVID when you had tickets on general sale because there wasn't enough local support. So it's very much been ups and downs with the club. Uh, what's the mood like now? It must be really buzzing with the, the announcement of some of these players that have come in and, and the real statement of intent from the club. And that, that's it, Brethy. You know, you, you, you um, uh, Athlone is a football town. It's Garrison town. It, it, it's been known known for producing players um, and football teams over the years. Um, it has gone gone missing a while, you know, where, where I suppose the club, um, you know, true enough of their own, a few things came, came to play, it came to pass. Um, um, we, let's, there's no, there's no, yeah, I think there's a match fixing thing there where, where people come in from outside. I don't believe anyone at Athlone was, was involved in that. I, I think it was a thing that they were just unfortunate and um, where these guys promised to put money into a club that was struggling for money and, and it seemed to be that, that maybe it was for different purposes and um, you know I think it's hard to, it's hard to rub off it's hard to get away from that and um, and move on but the club have managed to do that and slowly, surely they, you know they've put things in place off the field that, that we can survive and we can keep going and uh, you know, we've a, we're a club that that you know are are in a good position now, good position, and we have um, some financial backing um, going forward, and we just have to be prudent with that and make sure that, you know we don't jump too far ahead of ourselves. That that we make sure that you know at Lone Town there is is there for 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 many hundreds more years. You know, one of the oldest clubs in the League of Ireland that we keep going, and that's very important. Um, and that there's football there for the the, the kids coming up. Um, it's also important that we link to, link in with the the local uh, community and kind of COVID again has stopped that a bit, but there, there's exciting stuff coming down the road. So it really is like uh, in a good place now. Um, it is now back to where it's it, it's improved. It's linked with the, the local people, the community. So um, it can only bode well for Athlone going forward. And you get a sense from the fundraisers that that were were done, where it was good feedback from from the community, from the public, and that's what we want. You know, so uh, I, I suppose the facilities are there now, and now it's just to get the team on the pitch that people that, that and 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 you know, 
people will come out if you're doing well people will come out and I understand that you know so hopefully you can just get maybe get a couple of good results starting off and uh, just set it in motion from there excellent well it's brilliant to see a whole new kind of clean broom coming through the, the club and really kind of creating that really positive vibe that's been coming out of the club over the last few weeks and months and uh, I wish you the very very best look ahead on and off the field for the club it's great to see the club uh, so obviously as you mentioned so historic within the league to, to be doing so well thanks very much for joining us guys thanks for having me very pleasure thanks David And I'm joined by the director and the filmer of that show, Oshin Warren. You're very welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brefney. Thanks for having me on. No, it's my pleasure to have you. Listen, I watched that um, last week when I saw it pop up on social media, as have thousands of other people. Uh, tell us a little bit about Shine, a Sligo Rovers documentary. Well, the project that started off, I got it, basically I got a copy of the Heritage Society, the coffee table book a couple of years ago. Uh, it kind of goes season by season through Sligo Rovers and through the history of the club and a couple of stories that, through it. And it, it got me thinking about doing something about that with the Heritage community, Heritage Club, for the club. And I met Michael, who's a relation of mine at a family wedding. And I got talking to him and we sat down and we chatted for a bit and we decided we'd we'd work something out and, and go for it. And it kind of grew from there. Michael opened some doors for me that I wouldn't, people I wouldn't have known, like um, Joe Martin, for example. And uh, we, it's important to kind of just say that this, a lot of this was shot pre COVID. Like Joe is older, he's in his mid nineties. We wouldn't have approached him in the current situation to do this, but we filmed him in October, 2019, a couple of weeks after the wedding, and we chatted and we kind of went from there. The club had their, their night, um, the, the outdoor museum, the launch of the outdoor museum and Billy Sinclair was there. So to kind of start, not start from there, but it kind of grew into that. We talked to Billy that night, we got some nice footage of Billy meeting uh, Fago. Um, we got people looking at the outdoor museum for the first time. And, that that outdoor museum in, in itself, like I've been to a, a number of League of Ireland grounds like yourself, like a, a lot of them through the country. And there's there's nothing I've seen that even slightly resembles that. Like that outdoor museum is brilliant. That Heritage Society book is brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose um, we actually bumped into each other the night you were filming at that Shamrock Rovers game, yeah. which was the last game that was played before COVID in the league. And I suppose you were very lucky to get all of that in pre the shutdown. Yeah, like I was asked before, was it a COVID project? You know, is this something you, you did to keep yourself occupied? And no, it, 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 it genuinely wasn't. As you can as you can see yourself, we started this pre-COVID, and in retrospect, we were very lucky. Like there's there's elements that had to be had to be left out. Like I wanted to get some of the, the Dublin Supporters Club in Dublin. Like I. I live in Dublin, well, I live in Galway, but I'm kind of working in Dublin, so I'm kind of commuting. And it was important for me to show people from outside Sligo supporting the club, because I think the, the Dublin Supporters Club and kind of, not expats, but people that are outside of Sligo, how important the club is to them. Like, it's very important to me. And I don't live in Sligo. I haven't lived in Sligo since the early 2000s, like. Well, let's talk about that, because what's the motivation for, for making this documentary? Obviously, that's what you do, but why Sligo Rovers 
if you're not from in the area in the last two decades, what keeps drawing you back? It's the club. Like I, I have a great attachment to the club. Like when when I, I go up to Sligo maybe once every two months or so, um, I try to kind of time my, my going up to when there's a match on. So I, I go to a match with my dad. My dad goes to games, every, well, every second week for the last, I don't know, 50 years, probably longer. Um, and I, I, that's my kind of attachment. I, I, that's my, like, as Dermot Kelly says in, in the book, like he, he never followed any English things. Now I do follow an English thing, but not to the same extent. Like I, my, I like following League of Ireland. I like following Rovers. I do watch the Premier League. I watch the Champions League. I watch all that. But my heart is it's like Rovers. That like everything else is just a little bit of gloss. Like, and of course the the documentary. Everyone, I suppose, that people watching this interview or who are currently following the League of Ireland know Sligo Rovers as maybe that FAI Cup specialist from eight to ten years ago. They won the league in twenty twelve. <laughs> There's names. Alan, who's presenting this show, is yeah. is one of the names and the heroes of, of the current crop of Sligo Rovers. But this documentary doesn't really deal with that at all. It, it kind of spans those two periods from the early days, but predominantly from that Billy Sinclair-led team, as you mentioned, in 77, right through to the floodlights coming on and the Willie McStay era in the early 90s. Uh, and it's it's a really nice deep dive into one of the, I suppose, the the major players in the League of Ireland. And it's it's a really, really nice piece of work. Tell us about one aspect of it that I really, really liked, and that is the the music, because it's so almost haunting the whole way through it, but it just kind of plays that really nice narrative the whole way underneath, and it really adds to the experience of watching it for maybe 35 minutes. Yeah, there's two questions there. Like, we did, con- we did end up concentrating on that period between Billy Sinclair and Willie McStay. And we, we didn't really set out with a plan, um, but we, we kind of, that's where the story kind of ended up. When we sat down and I started editing through it, that's where we kind of found the story was Fago. Now, the music, the music, when we were sitting down editing, was vital, it was brilliant. There's a friend of mine that I've known since St. John's who did all the music, Kirsten McLaughlin, and he has a couple of different groups of musicians that he plays with and that and he his his music is very atmospheric there's there's a lot going on in it and it kind of it just it leads to an, a, a real atmosphere of it like it just kind of hooks you in and he gave us he gave us all his files or all, all his songs and basically just said look i trust you to go do something nice with it go use it like there was no there was no issue there um there was no issue there with, uh, with how we how we went about using it. He knew we'd do a, a job that we were interested in doing and doing something really nice. Like it, it really added. I, I feel it really added to the piece. You can see it in the in the trailer. Like if you change the music in that trailer, that that trailer doesn't make a lot of sense. If you just put in, you know, generic beats or you just put in something, it doesn't. It's that really kind of haunting sound, as you said yourself. Like, but his his music goes throughout it, through interviews, everything, and I think it really just hooks the whole thing together. Now, Pierce grew up by the showgrounds as well. Near enough. Yeah. Anyway. And another another lovely character in the documentary almost is actually the town itself and, and the region and Ben Bulbin yeah. comes in. That, that lovely view as uh, anyone who's ever been on the, the water bus on from Drummer Hare down to, to Sligo and Northwell, that view as you come down the Garavo with Ben Bulbin yeah. open up there's a lovely drone shot of that. But the cinematography in it is is fantastic. Um ha- there's, there's been a lot of work, I suppose, recently. I, I'm looking to think maybe Amazon Prime have done a lot of work on the All or Nothing series. They've been with Spurs, they've been with Tottenham, or Tottenham, they've been with Man City, they've been with a couple of um, NFL sides in the States. Would you be interested in that kind of thing? Is that something that could work in a League of Ireland context? Uh, I, I, I Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a question of resources. Like, I was doing this part-time finding time, finding equipment to go do it. If you were to commit to doing one entire season with one club, you're basically living with them, showing off everything to do to that start. Like the resources required for that are, are fairly high, are fairly, fairly full on. Like I, I know, and I, I can't say, but I, I know of one League of Ireland club that there's research going into a possibility of doing something similar. But you're you're talking. You need big money to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. You're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, because you're basically going to put one or two individuals into the team, embed them in the squad for a full season, seven or eight months, eight, nine months, or whatever it might be. And there's a lovely mix to the documentary. There's a lovely feel. It includes the underage players, male and female, includes yeah. local media, some former players, officials, and even some of the fans. And I think for me, uh, getting in to see Anthony Kilfeather's collection uh, was just a little bit special. Uh, what was your favorite moment in the film? Uh, well, I, I go, I deal with Anthony's first, like, I don't. Michael opened the doors to go into Anthony's house. And when you go into Anthony's upstairs, he has he, his good sized room devoted to Sligo Rovers stuff. You go into it. And I, as going in there as a Sligo Rovers fan, or even going in there as a League of Ireland fan, it's like going into it's like going into a personal museum. He has bits of everything. Like there's medals, there's uh, cups, there's trophies, there's programs, there's scarves, everything. And he just wandered around in it. And he's going, oh, this is this, is this. this is Seamus Coleman's jersey. This is a league winner's medal. This is a cup winner's medal. This is a cup, this is a cup winner's medal that was spelt wrong. Uh, you know, he has everything. People just hand, hand him stuff and go, we trust you to take care of it. We, we know that it'll be in a good home. And someday, I, I know it's one of the hopes that a heritage society is to eventually have a safe, secure space in town or in the showgrounds or wherever that they can show this place off to the public and have a have a museum for the club the the memorabilia is already there i think their big concern is having somewhere safe and secure yeah i think uh, and this um, this masterpiece to be quite honest it's one of the best things i've seen in the league of ireland uh, in the last 20 odd years and, and kudos to you and to to michael for pulling that all together it's, it's great to kind of to see it all um in it's just it just it's it's worth watching even if you're not a like a rose fan it is definitely ha worth having a look Oshin, thank you so much to, for joining us can you let people know where they can find uh, the interview obviously of course we'll put the a link to it in the description notes here and on our website but uh, where can people look it up and then see it for themselves well it's on youtube and all they have to do is go uh, search shine a sligo rovers documentary it should pop up it has six thousand eight hundred views as of before this interview so it's going well it's there it's available and the, the reason we put it on youtube is to give people access without any restrictions excellent so it's free as well nobody even has to pay to watch it so and how did you it. what's that how did you fund it uh my own back pocket <laughs> and you're just giving it away amazing uh, no well the, the idea that i had initially was to put it into a film festival and that's why i wanted to shoot it as best i could put in the effort with the lenses and the cameras and, and the way we went about it and the more i kind of looked into it there's a lot of restrictions with film festivals they want to be the one that shows it first etc et and there's there's an element of kind of exclusivity about it but the club isn't like that the club is open to everybody people can come along there's no problem so i i was more comfortable with putting it on youtube and just giving it giving to people and letting them have the access to go do it listen Oshin, thank you very much for joining us and the very best of luck with the documentary can't wait to see what happens next thanks very much Bethany. cheers I really enjoyed that chat with Oshin when I caught up with him earlier in the week. And Alan, have you seen the documentary? I have. It's really, really. He's himself and Michael have have put a, a tremendous uh, documentary together. It's it's actually for me going back, looking back on the history and and what it means to the community, the community, you know, and the club. It's a, a brilliant piece put together. Yeah, I think for me, the, we, we showed the trailer in that interview and it, it probably doesn't even do justice to how good the detail and the content of it is because it's just cinematic shots. It is. It looks like that the whole way through. The whole thing is very, very good. Check it out. If you put that in, as, as Oshin said in the interview, if you put in Shine, a Sligo Rovers documentary, you will find it on YouTube. It's free to watch. It doesn't cost you a penny and it'll whet your appetite for getting back in the turnstile at wherever your local League of Ireland ground may be over the next eight to nine months. Alan, thank you very much for joining us. It's been uh, great to have you for the launch of uh, FinalWhistle.ie, which of course is a new platform covering all of Irish sport, but we're starting with the League of Ireland and the Women's National League. Uh, you can catch our show uh, hosted by myself and Stephanie Roach for the Women's National League as well, if that interests you. 
we'll be talking to some pretty cool guests on that as well. Uh, that's also out today. This will be a weekly show. We'll have a revolving guest. Alan has been with us. This He's going to be back with us through the season, but we'll have plenty of other names uh, popping in and out to have a chat with you over the year. Alan, hope you enjoyed it. Loved it. Yeah, thanks. I'm really looking forward to coming back. No. <laughs> too much stick either. <laughs> already, already. Uh, I'm sure the Shamrock Rovers fans will be all over you purely for the, the terminology you use to describe them. I'm uh, pleading the fifth on that one. I'm staying away out of that. I'm not getting involved in that discussion. They can, they can talk to Alan directly on, on Twitter. He loves the, yeah. the little bit of a beef and he'll be well able for it. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Check everything out on finalwhistle.ie and we look forward to being with you again next week. Talk to you soon.